Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of our podcast, Sex in the Bull City. I'm Sophia Caudill from Durham, North Carolina um, at our practice here in uh, Bull City Psychotherapy here in Durham. And I have got one of my good friends, a fellow CSAT with me today to talk about mother hunger, Kelly McDaniel. And um, we're going to talk with Kelly for a little while this morning about her new book that she is writing and it has not come out yet. And um, I've, I've been waiting on pins and needles for it to come out. I'm so excited, but I've, I've read some work that she's doing. I'm gonna let her explain a lot of it to us. Um, Kelly is also um, a real pioneer in our field of sex and love addiction, um, as far as female sex and love addiction goes. So she's written another book that I have right here that I want to show everyone. Um, she's written another book called Ready to Heal. This is basically, at least for me, and I think a lot of my fellow therapists, this is really a, like a Bible um, for female sex and love addiction. I know whenever I have a client who comes in um, who's female, obviously, and there's some relationship issues going on, potentially some trauma um, or sex and love addiction that, that, you know, she's not really sure if she fits. Um, Ready to Heal is, is a book that, that we get going in the practice as soon as possible. Um, it is incredibly helpful. Um, it is primarily aimed at women, but I have to say, and maybe I'll have time to ask Kelly in this conversation, I have many men who read Ready to Heal and they're like, oh, wow, is it okay if, if I love this book also? And I'm like, of course it is. So that's also a great book that I'd love to have Kelly back again that we can dive into that. But for now, let's, let's go ahead and um, see if we can find out a little bit from Kelly about what mother hunger is. Kelly, thanks so much for joining me. I'm so excited that we're having this conversation. I am too. This is my favorite topic and I'm a little possessed right now. So thank you for um, being willing to enter the conversation with me. Yeah. Awesome. So um, yeah, I know you've been writing your book for a while now and you are just immersed in it in such a great way. Um, the, the, the end product is going to be just amazing for everyone. So I'm so excited. Um, but Mother Hunger, what an intriguing name is that? Can you just explain to us a little bit about what that is. Sure. Um, the, there are two things that come to my mind as you talk about the name, because I think the name itself has its own impact um, and doesn't need much explanation because it, it, it sounds like what it is. Um, mother hunger is a hunger for a particular type of love this particular type of love is what we generally assign to mothers. Um, but I've defined it as nurturing, protection, and guidance. So those are the three main categories, I guess, that we as infants and toddlers need. And as growing people, we continue to need guidance. So um, I guess that would be the short definition of mother hunger. It would be those three primary needs. So mother hunger can be on a spectrum, on a continuum. You know, if you grew up and you had some mother nurturing, let's say, um, but didn't really have any protection, that's going to be a different kind of mother hunger than if you had no nurturing and no protection. Um, and then if you also had no guidance, that's third degree mother hunger, but we can talk about that if it comes up. Okay, so I, I guess just hearing you, thanks for giving us an introduction to what mother hunger is, but just for um, the purposes of kind of like where my mind goes when I'm hearing you give that, that introduction, it almost sounds like any mother, any mother on the planet um, could be mothering in a way that there's going to be maybe a little bit of mother hunger. Like, is, does anyone come out unscathed? Are any of us able to do everything perfectly? Or how does that work? Or are you talking about severe, severe attachment wounding? Well, severe attachment wounding would be third degree mother hunger. Okay. What you're asking is a fabulous question. 
does anyone come out unscathed? Does a mother need to be perfect? Or if she's not, we're going to have a mother hunger situation. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Mothers are not supposed to be perfect. Babies are not designed to need a perfect mother. What babies do need and what infants do need is a mother who's aware enough that when she causes her infant to be afraid or neglects a cue, she repairs it. Okay. She, she's so tuned in that she notices when her infant is in distress and she responds. Mother hunger happens when a mother is so compromised, which um, we'll talk about how that happens if you'd like, that she can't see those cues. She misses those cues. And so infants may be too long, too often in a state of distress and fear which we know changes the architecture of the brain. So in the most rapid period of growth, which is the first four months of life, um, the brain is growing 400%. And that is when a mother's care is encoded, but it's nonverbal. It's purely a limbic right brain experience where the infant's learning about the world from how the world feels. And the whole world is the mother. That's why they call the first three months, the fourth trimester, really, that infants are made to still want to be very close to the mother. Her breathing regulates the baby's breathing, her sounds. The baby's so familiar with her sounds, they've been listening to it in utero for nine months, and her sounds are much more clear than anyone else's that are muffled through the amniotic fluid. Her sounds go straight through. Um, so babies already recognize their mother's voice and yearn for it. Um, so anyway, no, a mother doesn't need to be perfect. And yes, lots of people have bits of mother hunger, but I look at it on the attachment, like the attachment work that we know now. Mm -hmm. What the research tells us is about 50% of us are walking around with insecure attachment. 23% of us are going to be more avoidant. 27 or 8 are going to be more anxious those statistics don't even account for dis disorganized attachment, mm -hmm. but they do let us know that about half the population is securely attached. Those securely attached folks, they don't have mother hunger. They don't really resonate with this concept. The other half of the population has some form of it, but it's on a spectrum and it's in different degrees based on what was missing, nurturing, protection, or guidance, or all of it. Okay, really interesting. I'm just getting... Um completely immersed in this. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep thinking of my questions to ask. So is there a point um, in a child's development that, that it's safer for the mom to be like not as in tune? Definitely. Definitely. Okay. So in the first 1000 days, which includes pregnancy is when the brain is most vulnerable and needs her focus attunement. If she's able to do that, it's kind of like pay now or pay later. If you do it early, the resilience gets set, the secure gets set, and then the baby can tolerate, the toddler can tolerate lots more windows of distress. Um, so kids, especially in the first year of life, who have a really good solid foundation, the research shows that later in life, even at age three, but even later in adolescence, when stressful things happen, they don't develop a complex stress problem. They already have a safe base. They know where they can go home. Without that first year though, there's no home base. And, and stress impacts the child much more significantly across the lifespan. Mm, okay, oh wow. So what you're really talking about is um, moms who, are under extreme duress, um, or there's something that is is just really taking their their time and love and care and energy away from their baby, even when the baby is in utero. But that first year after, um, that's really of 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 the highest importance. Is is that when a mom is experiencing such duress or distress that she's not able to tend to the baby, her baby in in all ways and at least part of the time, um, that's when mother hunger is really going to come into play for the child as the child lives his or her life. Yes, exactly. 
And I think that it's important to acknowledge that living in a world where mothering is devalued and living in a world where part of the reason it's devalued is because I think if we had a better understanding of what was actually going on between a mother and a baby, we'd have to make a lot of systemic changes um, to support her. Because by not supporting a mother, we're not supporting the baby and we're growing an epidemic of addiction. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a systemic issue. It's not an individual parenting problem. This is a large problem. But with that said, I think if women are more aware of just how important each movement is to the infant in the first year, mothering might be a lot more exciting, not quite so boring, because you realize, wow, everything matters. And this is what's gonna set it up to be fun later. Might not be real fun right now. Mothers need to really know that that first year, that is work. That's not fun. This baby's not here for your entertainment. This is a full-time job. And so to expect ourselves as mothers to go back to a full-time job when we have this newborn, something's going to give. That's not maternal guilt. That's not shame. That is just the facts mm -hmm. that there is no such thing as you can do it all. There isn't. And I know that it's been marketed to us as women that we can do it all and we like that. And I think that's some of where the progress of feminism was really great, but it, it came from not understanding the infant needs um, and devaluing how important that mother and baby dyad are during that tender time. So what I'm really hearing from you also is that really we need to rethink our entire way that we educate women and men, not certainly not just women. We don't want to put all this on, on women. That's for sure. But, um, but the, but the whole understanding of that conversation with your doctor, even of, are you thinking about getting pregnant? Like long before someone even gets pregnant, um, women, again, and men, but I'm going to speak just to women right now. We need to really understand the implications of, like you were saying, this is real work. This is a job. This is 24 seven work. Um, and it's much harder. I mean, I know I stayed home with my son, um, and that, that was much harder than any job I've ever had. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, and so, but it's it's really just the education of of women really fully understanding the impact of of our choices and and conscious presence to our child in utero and after, like especially that first year, like you were saying, that's really important. So we're going to have to really re rethink a lot of things. I think. I think so too, and I, and I'm glad that you mentioned men because, you know, when a woman feels vulnerable which is inevitable with a new baby. Not only, every new mother is essentially a newborn herself. She goes back to primitive places in her own body and brain stem that are telling the story of what it was like when she was an infant. So depending on the kind of early care we had, we're not gonna be able to give what we don't have to our babies. With that, if we have a partner who's super aware of the magnitude of this job and our partner, male or female, is able to step in and offer protection and shelter so we can be vulnerable and tune in to our baby, that helps a whole lot. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think sometimes partners can be an added threat and an added stress to a mother rather than that imperative support. So yes, everyone needs education. Absolutely, um, that certainly makes a lot of sense. Even if we're not talking about mother hunger, um, certainly having the importance of a, of a supportive partner um, during that, that time of being a young mom, that, that's incredibly important. Yeah, even if someone's not getting to that level of duress that they would, they're gonna inflict mother hunger, it's still, it's still incredibly important. So let's talk a little bit about, um, Okay, so so someone has mother hunger. Um, how are they, or they can identify with that concept? Um, how are they going to either a find out what it is, but also b maybe how are they going to present? Like I could I could imagine like a hundred different ways that people might kind of move through this. There are at least a hundred different ways that mother hunger can present. Yeah. Um, 
And it, generally it's going to show up as a lifelong, kind of a lifelong process of always feeling low grade anxiety. Um, and then also sometimes that's, that can manifest as depression. Um, and generally people are going to show up having medicated that anxiety and depression with some kind of addictive process, substance or process. What I find with mother hunger in particular and women is that <clears throat> because this sets in so young, um, the lack of nurturing or the lack of protection impacts our nervous system before we have language, then the ways we learn to soothe ourselves are so primitive and also came online before we had access to drugs and alcohol. Those come later and help, but generally um, women with mother hunger have figured out how to self-soothe in ways that don't always appear right away when someone comes in for help. They're deeply secretive, sometimes unconscious, generally involving some kind of disordered relationship with food and eating, um, and also some kind of disordered way. I don't even like the word disordered because it was an, it was an adaptation. It was a very resilient adaptation that a little one learned. And so at some point, thumb sucking, they made us stop, right? <laughs> so most of us auto-regulated with some thumb sucking to calm ourselves. And when parents made us stop that, um, I have found that little ones um, resort to hair twirling, masturbating, um, stroking, or even harming, self-harming to kind of regulate their own nervous system. And this can start very young. Yeah, and when when you when I asked that question, I was really thinking of food, um, and I, I like that you mentioned and took it back even further. I remember reading this in your paper, the thumb sucking. Um, your that I mean, I guess you know, Freud. Everyone would say the oral fixation, but you know, it it re food really for many of us was our, you know, maybe earliest addiction, or if if it wasn't thumb sucking, and right. um, yeah, and so you know that. Uh, that and then I wonder how cigarettes would also fit into that because that's an oral fixation. But really interesting um, about. I think it's good to know though that um, thumb sucking is perfectly natural for a baby, and oral fixation. Unfortunately, Freud made that sound pathological. Babies are designed to suck. That's how they grow their jaw. That's how they grow their brain. It's how the teeth form. Um, you can't mess up a child's mouth or their teeth because they're sucking, sucking their thumb. That is a misinformation from medical science that, that's unfortunate. Um, babies need to suck. And they prefer to suck their mother's body and breast. And if that's not available, they've got to have something. And that's not a fixation. That's not a pathology. That is a normal biological need. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a, um, a reflex, actually. And yeah. so I, I totally agree. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was, I was sort of saying the Freud piece, like it's unfortunate that that's, that's, you know, that's what we say if, if we're, you know, right. people that, that remember Freud. But anyway, I, I agree with you. It's, it's a, it's a reflex. It is, it's survival. It's survival. Um, and, yeah. yeah. And, so, and so is the self-soothing piece that you were mentioning a, a few minutes ago that as we get older and we're, you know, going from thumb sucking to, to food, to smoking cigarettes, to maybe masturbating, to maybe, you know, sex addiction or whatever it might be, any other addiction, or just anxiety or depression, um, which is certainly going to be in there somewhere. Those are all tools of survival. Um, they're, they're all survival tools that, you know, we, when we didn't have what we needed when we were little, we've got mother hunger, that these are all the ways that we're learning to self-soothe and cope and survive. And so, um, I really like, I like your message. Um, I really, really appreciate your message that, that through, it's really through something very serious and, um, and severe that happened early on as to why people are sort of coming, you know, why they're feeling like they need to have these different tools of survival. Cause it's really, it's really that inbred from so long ago before they even learned how to walk and talk. 
Exactly, exactly. And these needs are so primitive and they're so universal that if we can meet them ourselves and it feels like love, it feels like a mother's touch, great, you know, stuffed animals, blankets. Um, it's why we have so many stories from people who had that first attachment object. They had that favorite blanket or they had that favorite stuffed animal. I have a great story where <clears throat> a little girl had her, her blanket was such a mess. I mean, it had formula crusted onto it and, and the smells of it. So as soon as she started preschool, her mother washed the blanket. And when she came home from preschool, she's two, she sobbed and cried. It didn't smell the same. This is a big deal. It really impacts our whole sense of, are we loved and is the world a safe place to be? And what you're really saying um, is, I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is, we're, this is, we're hardwired for these, these reactions um, and these also desires and reactions. Like our brain needs nurturing, protection, safety. It's not like you know, we're just deciding one day, oh, I need these things. No, we're, we're very much hardwired. Um, there's no choice in the matter, really. Um, and okay. so, yeah, no choice. And so, again, if we don't have something, most of us are going to learn how, how, to, how to cope with that in some, some way, sometimes good ways, sometimes not so great ways. And um, hopefully they'll be able to find your book and so they'll be able to get the appropriate help. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about, um, I want to talk a little bit about attachment. I don't want to get um, too deep into, into that work, but I was hoping you could explain a little bit to us about um, just basic attachment information. I know you talked a little bit about secure and, and other types of non-secure attachments, but what does this mean to the average person? Why is attachment important? Great question. It's becoming so wonderful that attachment's part of our mainstream dialogue now that we're learning about it. So attachment's important because if we understand how we learn to attach, it really helps us as we navigate our friendships, as we navigate our romantic relationships, and as we raise our own children. So we get our attachment style <clears throat> very early on. And, you know, we're, um, we don't have a choice in our attachment style. We develop it based on how we're cared for. So um, generally, I look at attachment on a spectrum just like I look at mother hunger on a spectrum. So we can either be on the more anxious end of the spectrum where we're kind of reaching for what we want. This is a demonstration of the protest effort that a baby makes. Protest efforts are crying, um, reaching, screeching. Those are ways of saying, hey, pay attention to me. So those are also signals of hope. Like a baby that's doing that still thinks somebody's going to come. Those are going to be the more anxiously wired adults. Now, I'm not talking about secure attachment right now. I'm just talking about insecure attachment. The avoidant adults... As infants, they look more like this. They look very disengaged, um, drowsy, mm -hmm. disinterested. They almost look hopeless and resigned. They've already figured out nobody's coming if they cry. That's a sad state of, I mean, it's, it's all unfortunate, but that is a baby that's already kind of given up and goes into a deeper part of the brainstem. So, um, Another way avoidant attachment can happen though, you can have someone that's fairly anxiously attached, but then as they get older, like in adolescence, if a parent is smothering, um, that can also create an adult who's more avoidant, like intimacy feels kind of um, icky. Yeah. Right? So avoidant attachment can really happen very young or it can still happen later on based on guidance. So, um, the, the attachment style that people really don't talk about that I'm going to talk about in Mother Hunger book, a whole chapter, is disorganized. Um, I call this third degree mother hunger. And that is the most extreme form of an attachment problem because there was no nurturing protection and no guidance. A great example of third degree recent in our culture, we just watched Renee Zellweger win the award for Judy Garland. 
Judy Garland's a great example of someone that grew up with third degree mother hunger. And I'll be writing about that in the book as well, where we see that her mother was the one pushing the drugs. Her mother didn't even want a baby. Actually, I don't know if that was evident in the movie, but I've researched it and um, she, her mother and father wanted an abortion. They, they didn't want another child. So we can take from that that Judy as a baby had very little, if any, nurturing. We saw her mother and how cold she was in the movie. Um, the father wasn't involved, but they, they made her a performer. That's how they made sense of having a child they didn't need. So they pushed her hard, um, kept her on a diet. Um, so they primed her for addiction. She wasn't protected from the MGM studios, so she was molested there. Um, that's an example of having none of those maternal needs met by even someone not the mother. Sometimes people that are not the mother can meet some of those needs for us, and then we don't have third degree mother hunger. Judy Garland did, and she died at the age of 47. Disorganized attachment will impact our life. We will have health problems our entire life. It is a form of complex trauma. It's a form of betrayal trauma. It compromises our immune system. We're constantly inflamed and definitely need an addiction. And generally we die young. Mm, okay. And so um, people that are listening to this podcast and, and watching our video now, let's just take it from um, less complex of a situation to the disorganized um, piece that you just mentioned. So people who have mother hunger um, maybe had um, either good or fairly decent mothering in utero and through age one or so, but then maybe trauma to the mom started happening like later in life. Um, and so they can identify with some of this mother hunger, maybe not all of it, maybe not to a third degree, but what can people who are in that boat, how can they help themselves? What should they be doing, do you think? The people that are not third degree or the people that are third degree? Not third degree yet. <laughs> well, generally, you don't develop third degree mother hunger later in life. No, I meant they're not, third. We're, we'll get to the third degree in a minute. So yeah. just- Okay. The, yeah, sort of the e not easier. I don't want to say easier, but less complex mother right. hunger. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, less complex mother hunger responds really well to treatment. Um, less complex mother hunger is like in the attachment circles. We talk about earning a secure attachment. Like if you didn't have one as a child, you can earn one as an adult by finding people who can be with you in a way that is safe and offer what you missed. So let's say that, I will use myself as an example, that I had, let's say some nurturing but no protection. Once I know that, and I would like to be more secure in my attachment style, I'd like to be less anxious, I'm going to look for people, places, and things that offer me protection or vice versa, let's say I had plenty of protection, but I wasn't nurtured, I'm going to be looking for things that offer me nurturing in a very safe way. Healthy massage, um, warm baths, um, cozy blankets, my pets, mm -hmm. my, my pets are gonna regulate my nurturing needs. I think the mistake that a lot of us make is we don't know what we missed, and we expect that our primary lover will meet those needs for us unconsciously we expect that and then we're disappointed when it doesn't happen and then that gets to be a cycle that's very difficult to break so um really knowledge is power and yeah. so knowing what we were missing is is potentially one of the first steps um after we realized hey there might i might be able to you know i'm, I'm kind of identifying with this mother hung, hunger information let me figure out what i had what i didn't have um so reading your book will be helpful and then maybe talking with a therapist who really works in this way. And so I know before we came on, we were talking about different types of therapy, but being able to work with a therapist who really understands attachment, attachment styles, attachment wounding and attachment repair and, and someone who can really understand trauma and, and who treats trauma. It sounds like what you're saying. Um, in some, some alternative therapeutic way, not just talk therapy. 
but being able to do something else like EMDR or somatic experiencing or brain spotting, something like that, because um, you were you were mentioning you were mentioning strategies that are not about talk therapy, like uh, even having like a blanket. That's more of an alternative therapy, like a weighted blanket. Um, okay, so that's really good. So I want to make sure that people can hear that. First of all, your message of we can learn this is huge. And I just want to repeat that and elevate that. So all hope is certainly not lost. Um, just because we were missing something as children does not mean our brain can't unlearn and relearn. And so that's really, that's huge. Um, I can't wait to read that in your book. But, but the knowledge and, uh, is power concept of we need to know what we were missing so that we can give that to ourselves, also find relationships that are healthy. And a therapist who is experienced in the deep work of attachment and really intimacy is what we're also talking about here, healthy intimacy. Um, that's a person who can be a guide in, in this work. Exactly. And I think there are some <clears throat> really, really well-trained therapists now in the field of trauma and attachment. Um, but I also want to just it, it kind of normalize that um, because these needs are so primitive <clears throat> and pre-verbal, um, sometimes <laughs> this is why people do really well in 12-step groups as well. Sponsors can be super helpful. Um, I think anyone who knows what it feels like to be hurt, and has found a way to get to the other side can be really helpful um, in, in, as a companion. I think what's important to, to know that mother hunger might need a few people to help, <laughs> you know, the therapist and the sponsor and a massage therapist and a dog, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. that, that it's, it, it's a team. In, in fact, I think we'd have a lot less mother hunger if a village were, were raising our babies. Right, so yeah. we need a village to raise ourselves. We need a village to come into our own rescue. And that doesn't mean we're weak. It doesn't mean we're broken. It means that we are going to now be the mother we needed. Yeah, um, I, I love, love your message. Um, I just wanted to, first of all, I, I love 12 Steps. So I'm so glad you brought that up. I, I was thinking about bringing it up, but I'm glad you did. Um, you're so right. Uh, um, uh, a solid sponsor um, can do so much. I think for a lot of people, sometimes myself included, where that sponsor relationship is really powerful. Um, they know where we've been and they've been there. And so that's, that's so huge. Just that witnessing, you're right. Of, yeah. Oh, wow, this person has made it to the other side. I can do that too. Exactly. That, yeah, that message of hope is huge. Um, and then the other thing that's actually really um, helpful, if anyone is interested, there's a, a trauma meeting on a website called In the Rooms. Every Wednesday night at 8.30 Eastern, there's a trauma meeting, and it's really helpful. They work from a book um, called, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's something about trauma and recovery, but it's by Pete Walker. That's not what it's called. I've got it right here in my office, but I'm not going to get it. That's a really helpful um, resource. That's free. So, and 12 steps are free. And so anything that's free is awesome. You can do it the rest of your life. And it's just such a gift. And you're right. That team approach is necessary. It, it, I mean, I find that you're right. It doesn't mean we're broken. It means that, hey, we're, we're, we're smart. You know, we're using all of our skills and tools to, to patch together what we didn't have that we know we need now because we're using our adult healthy brain. And, and let's give ourselves those things. So that's, I think that's huge empowerment. Um, that's great. And then um, can you just talk to us a little bit about um, this third degree mother hunger? What, if, I do know, I work with so many people that do have third degree mother hunger. And so what, what have you found is, is really their, their path? Well, Again, we're talking about disorganized attachment when we're talking about third degree mother hunger. <clears throat> so the path is long and it's good to people, it's good that we know that out front. I think it's good that therapists know that too because I think sometimes therapists can get discouraged and think I'm not doing a good job if our client is still struggling and they've been with us for five years. 
That doesn't mean we're not doing a good job. This is lifelong work. Disorganized attachment is so profound that <clears throat> it, it's, it's lifelong work. So what I have found that has helped women who have third degree mother hunger, and this is why I designed intensives, that our, our therapy or an hour and a half therapy once a week just doesn't touch it. It just doesn't touch it. And unfortunately, that's the model that's set up for psychotherapy by the insurance companies. So I've had to design other ways of doing therapy. So now I, I don't work in under three hours and I generally do a 10 to a 15 hour intensive with someone one-on-one -on -one because what I'm doing is imprinting that early dyadic nuance that was missing. That just takes sitting with someone who's tuned into you for hours where your body understands, oh, this is what it feels like to be looked at with gentleness. This is what it feels like to be protected and safe in a space. And this person's guiding me because I'm doing things during the intensive that are helpful. But it's really sometimes just about the concentrated time. And I think that's why sponsors can be so helpful because a sponsor's not having to just see you for an hour. They can spend all day with you doing a fourth and fifth step and that repairs the brain. Mm -hmm. That is huge. Um, that is, that's so important. It reminds me of a couple of other therapies. It reminds me of Haiti Schleifer's and counter-centered couples therapy where there's limbic resonance and, and co-regulation within the couple. And it's just that it's that conscious presence, like you're saying, um, it's it's huge to the brain. So it's you know the way I think about it is it's the brain relearning how to use a muscle that hasn't maybe sometimes ever been used, or or in a lot of people's cases maybe they really haven't felt that safe you know since they were little. Um, so e either way, but it's the ability for that brain to be in that place of it's going to be uncomfortable at first and then to regulate and get comfortable, that's, that's exercise for the brain and it's you know, the brain strengthening that muscle of secure attachment. That's so important. Um, Kelly, um, I have like a hundred things I wanna ask you, but I think what I'm gonna do instead, cause we're kind of, I don't wanna have it be too long because cause I, you know, I wanna have you back again. <laughs> so that's why I don't wanna have it be too long for my own selfish pleasure. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I, I just want to ask with what we've talked about today, um, is there anything that you think that, that we've missed that you feel like you want to touch on before we end this segment and maybe we'll talk again soon? Um, I think this has been just delightful and I love your questions and I love your insights and something you just said sparked something that maybe we ought to mention um, when you're talking about the brain growing the muscle for intimacy folks with disorganized attachment and third degree mother hunger. Um, even though I'm saying here, I, I treat by using these intensive models and, and that short therapy isn't very effective. I, I really need to backtrack of that and say that um, the intimacy threshold is so small for folks with disorganized attachment that early therapeutic intervention does need to be short and brief. <laughs> it's when that starts to grow that someone with third degree mother hunger benefits from more time. So I just needed to correct that. And to me, it, it's kind of so intuitive now that I forget I need to say things like that, but I don't work in an intensive form with folks with third degree mother hunger unless they've had years of therapy first. And we've done a very extensive intake and it's just not appropriate for everybody. It's hard to do. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of um, energy and discipline and, and and it's you know the brain has to learn how to do that and um and you're right it, it, it sometimes it is done in small snippets um to kind of be able to get to the place where someone can sit with you for a day or two in a row exactly. um, yeah and then but you know even when people do intensives i do intensives also um you could you know everyone can't tolerate the same and so even if someone's listening to this and they're thinking oh gosh i don't know that I could do that with my therapist. I don't know if he or she would want to meet with me for three or four hours. You know, ask and, and talk with them and, and, and have that conversation about, do you think I could do this with you? Do you think I'm ready? And if I'm not ready, how can I get ready? Um, because that's that very deep work 
um, of psychotherapy, you and I, when we were talking before we came on, that, you know, not all therapists do that very deep work. And that's okay. Everybody's got their different areas that they specialize in. But someone who's listening to this, and this is new for you, and, and I'm so glad if you're watching or tuning in, but it's okay to have that conversation with your therapist. And if he or she is a, a good match, great. If not, that's okay for you to shop around and find someone who's different. Um, again, this very deep work is not done by everyone. And so it's important to advocate for yourself and that's also part of getting back to the nurturing and protection and guidance of being able to do that for yourself. As, as Kelly so eloquently told us about mother hunger at the beginning, Kelly, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I am so thrilled um, to get to read your entire book. I'm excited for the ways that it's, um, there's a lot of similarities to um, grief and ambiguous grief work that I'm doing. And I can't wait to talk with you more about that. But um, I'm just thrilled that you're bringing this information forth to everyone. So thank you so much for doing this work. I know it has been a, a hard labor. It really has been. Well, thank you so much for your interest in the topic and, and discussion today. Great questions and great insights. So thanks to Kelly for being here with us today. And I'm so excited. Um, that we have had her on. So this is my first, for anyone who's um, paying attention to our podcast, this is my first Zoom recorded video podcast. So I'm like being so techie today. I've got a podcast going at the same time of my Zoom conversation. So if I've been sort of looking around, you'll know why. Um, tech is not my day job. <laughs> and so <laughs> there's a reason that it takes some of my energy. But thank you so much, Kelly. Um, this has been a lovely conversation. I love how you're going to be helping so many people. And um, thanks, for, so thanks for spending your morning with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophia. Take care. Bye-bye.